He also spoke about the Warriors potentially, quote unquote, wanted to make a trade with the Clippers to get his services. And that's another team that's quickly skated and trying to avoid the second apron. Even though they drafted all their players, the Warriors benefited from the cap going up in 2017. That's how they were able to sign Kevin Durant and maintain their stars. And you could even look at Stephen Curry. They signed him a few years ahead knowing that the cap was going to go up and they took advantage of him having ankle issues. He signed a much lesser deal than he normally would have gotten. But again, the Warriors are a franchise right now in flux and they're trying to adapt to the brand new landscape of the NBA, especially when it pertains to the new CBA. That was a real thing. Like, that was a real thing. That was close to, to being done. Um, that deal was well, was close to being done from from what I was being, you know, told on the situation, um, you know, they was expressing like just how much they wanted me there, how I could have fit in perfectly with, you know, Draymond, um, Steph, Clay probably would have stayed. Kaminga, like Wiggins, they didn't know how or what, you know, package was gonna be there um, to trade for me, but. It seems like that team is in an influx in between kind of building for the generational talent that they have now and Stephen Curry, best utilizing him, trying to put him in a position to win the most championships as possible. And at the same time, they're trying to make sure that they have a product for their brand new Chase Arena, which is a cash generating cow. I mean, they make $500 million more than the Lakers and Knicks or just any other large market NBA franchise. It's just unreal, the formula that they have generating money with that stadium. And, you know, it was still an opportunity to stay close to home, stay on the West Coast. Um, and, and you know, it was a win-win. Like, I think Steph is a unicorn, one-of-one one player. And Joel's a unicorn, one-of-one one player. So yeah. it was kind of like mm -hmm. uh, a good situation to be in the middle of. Um, but ultimately, like, the deal didn't go through. I think Clippers didn't want a certain trade deal that Warriors were willing to give. And, yeah, it just didn't happen. But it was close. It was, it was, it was close. So it is what it is. We see the Clippers maneuvering after PG had left. They signed Kevin Porter Jr. on a two-year guaranteed deal with a second-year player option. And if it works out, it's a good deal for them. We've seen them go into that kind of... Josh Primo bag before getting players with questionable pass. But going into next season, it'll be interesting to see what exactly is going to be their identity. With them building their roster back up with old faces like Nick Batoon. They still got Norman Powell on the books, guys like Terrence Mann. But with PG no longer there, will James Harden be ready to carry the load, especially with Kawhi Leonard in and out the lineup? The Clippers continue to have a shaky history with superstar players like Blake Griffin. And Steve Ballmer, he's going to have to actually bounce back from this. With Paul George painting such a picture of them just lowballing him, even though he had all the leverage in the world. They got a brand new arena. The cap is going up. There's other teams that are going to be bidding for Paul George's services and willing to give him the contract that he's looking for. The way they approached him, having one foot in, one foot out, not really wanting to give him the same deal as Kawhi, then at the last minute, they try to give him the deal. So he was in the right to call their bluff, and now he's in greener pastures in Philadelphia with a great opportunity to compete for a championship.